Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us. And so just to make sure I'm going to go over the supplies really quick. And if you are missing something, feel free to kind of grab it while I'm going through a little introduction. But you should have your nice long strip of paper that you were instructed to make out of a normal size paper cut into three strips, taped together end to end with tape only on one side and then some markers. And that is all that you will need for today. So let me jump in and just give you a little intro as to what we're gonna be talking about today. All right, so we're gonna be talking about the actual scale of the solar system to understand a little better the challenges of navigating the solar system, sending spacecraft out and getting them where they need to be and then how we control them and operate them. So here's a typical picture of the solar system you might see in a book or on a website. And it, this isn't what the solar system really looks like. And in fact, I bet any picture you will see does not actually reflect what the solar system looks like. We're gonna try and do that today with our map, though there's still gonna be some things that we can't accurately do. So one thing I wanna notice about this is I like that they include a lot of different things. The solar system, of course, is a lot more than just planets. It has tons of cool stuff in it, and planets are only one type of object in the solar system. So this doesn't just show the eight planets, it also shows the fact that there are two belts of objects and that there are dwarf planets in those belts. And another thing this shows, of course, is that the giant planets are bigger, the rocky planets are smaller, and also, this is key, shows that the rocky planets, the four inner planets, are spaced closer together. So let's talk about some things that are wrong with this diagram. First of all, the distances are roughly relative in that some planets are closer and some planets are farther away, but it's not completely accurate. Um, so that is something we're going to see today is different from any picture you've probably seen. Um, the relative sizes are also not quite shown correctly. That previous one, Jupiter looks about five times bigger than Earth, but in actuality, this picture shows more accurately the sizes in that Jupiter is more like 10 times as wide as the Earth. So now I'm going to run through some pictures. We're going to go through this quickly. You guys will be able to go and look at these slides in more detail later on from the website. So we're going to start at the outer part of the solar system and work our way in. So out at the edge is going to be Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, which we see a lot of these things are brownish red. Next in will be Neptune, which is very blue. Then Uranus, which is kind of this pretty turquoise. I'm choosing one color today for each. I'm gonna go with green just to make it look different from Neptune. Then next in is Saturn, which is very golden. So I think I'm gonna use like a yellow. Jupiter has lots of different colors, but a lot of them are orangey browns. So I'm gonna grab my orange for that one. Then the asteroid belt. Asteroids are typically pretty grayish, a little bit of brownish gray and Ceres. <clears throat> Sorry here, my voice is cutting out. Then there's Mars, of course, the red planet, and Earth, the blue planet, and then Venus is kind of yellowish, though that little inset picture shows you it actually is white to our eyes. So, And then Mercury, which is also rather grayish, slightly brown, but those are the pictures we want to kind of have in our heads. So I'm going to stop sharing now, and I want to make sure everyone has your view on speaker view, because I want you to be able to see what I'm doing really easily so that my video is nice and big. So we have our strip of paper, and we're going to do the sun at one side and the Kuiper belt, the inner edge of the Kuiper belt, on the other side. Now, we won't be able to do sizes on this, only distances. And so what I want you to do for the sun is not make a big circle at one end. You can pick whichever end you want. We're just going to color the very edge, you know, just like one marker width of yellow, like a millimeter. Just kind of tint the edge yellow just to remind us that's the sun. And the reason that I'm doing that instead of drawing a circle is, again, we're going to have to fit a lot of planets close to the sun we saw. And also, if we were to do things on this scale and try to show the size of things as well as the distances, the sun, the biggest thing in the solar system, would be the width of one of your hairs. 
and Jupiter would be 10 times smaller and Earth would be 100 times smaller. So we cannot do the sizes on this scale. We can only do the distances. If you want to do size and distance together, you have to go somewhere like the Sagan Planet Walk in downtown Ithaca, which is over a kilometer long and the planets are like this. So going now from your sun side to the opposite edge of your paper. This is the inner part of the Kuiper belt. And as we saw, they're kind of reddish brown. So I'm gonna grab a brown. I'm gonna start by making the Kuiper belt right on this edge. Again, just a little bit on the edge, make a bunch of tiny brown dots. So I'm just gonna kind of plop like little freckles, just little ones. And those are the Kuiper belt objects like Arakoff we saw. So I can show there are my little brown dots. Now, slightly off center and in this, I'm gonna make one slightly larger brown dot for Pluto. And I'm gonna put it off center right at the inner edge there, simply because its orbit is tilted a little bit with respect to all the other planets there. Okay, Pluto currently is at the inner edge of the Kuiper belt. The Kuiper belt actually would extend a whole nother piece of paper. So take one of these papers, and again, that's the whole Kuiper belt, which Pluto does drift through, but it's currently at the inner edge. Next is Neptune. I'm gonna grab my blue, and I'm gonna put Neptune just to the inside of the Kuiper belt. There are a few Kuiper belt objects that actually cross Neptune's orbit, and I'm gonna make kind of a medium-sized circle. So I'm just gonna roughly draw it. So I'm gonna make my Neptune right about there and kind of color it in blue. If you wanna go, if you wanna really just make circles and go back later and fill in more artistic details, maybe look up pictures of the planets or get these slides, feel free to do that. All right, I said I was gonna do green for Uranus. So Uranus, to get to that, we're gonna go all the way to this first taped together edge. So it's going to be right on that first taped edge and make it about the same size as Neptune. So there I've made it. And of course, Uranus is famous for being the planet that's tipped on its side. And the way to show that is to draw its rings also tipped straight up and down. So I'm going to sketch in really quick just some rings, just a ring to show that. So we see that's the tipped on its side planet. It's right there at that junction. And again, you can go back and fill this in later. All right, next up is Saturn. Now I said Saturn's kind of golden, so maybe yellow, but I'm gonna use orange just so you can see it. The yellow's hard to see on the camera. Saturn is going to be all the way into that next piece of paper, all the way to here. And make it nice and big because Saturn is the second biggest planet. So make a nice big Saturn and give it some rings that are just a little tilted. And you can fill in bigger, more beautiful rings later on. But there's my nice big fat Saturn. So this is what we've got so far. Now, notice that we are only three planets out of eight in and we've already used up two thirds of our strip. I think now we're getting the point of it's way more dramatic than it looks in the pictures. I'm going to hold on to my orange because I'm going to do orange for Jupiter too. Jupiter, we've only got one strip of paper left. Now as we got us fold. So you're going to take your sun edge and you're going to fold it to where Saturn is. So basically folding that strip of paper in half. So that now I've got a fold halfway between the sun and Saturn. And that's where I'm going to put Jupiter. Again, nice big, because it's one of the giant planets. One is the biggest planet in the whole solar system. So I'm going to make a nice big Jupiter. And again, you can fill in more artistic later. <laughs> this is getting worse, right? Now I only have this amount of space to fit the asteroid belt and four inner planets. It's going to get tight. And now we see why I told you not to make the sun take up a lot of space. So next is the asteroid belt. To find that, you're going to take again your sun and you're going to fold it in to where Jupiter, that Jupiter fold was. So kind of fold that in half now. So that now you've got a halfway point between the sun and Jupiter. And then you're going to take like two fingers. Oh, let's do this series. So grab a gray, they're kind of gray, and make about a Pluto-sized dot right on that fold. 
Don't make it too big. Ceres is small, it's a dwarf planet. So right there, little, little gray dot. Now take two fingers, put them centered over that and make like a little dot on either side of your fingers. That's how wide the asteroid belt is. And now you can kind of, again, freckle, fill that space in with some asteroids. So there's what I've got for the asteroid belt. All right, so now I am down to this amount of space to fit all four inner planets. Here we go. We're going to do a lot of folding in half. So now you're going to fold the sun into the series fold. So fold in half again. And before you open that, really tightly hold where it is on that series and fold it again in half. So you've got it folded in half here. I want you to take it and then fold it in half again. And that way you end up with three folds between series and the sun. One, two, three. So we're gonna call these fold one, fold two, and fold three, working our way toward the sun. All right, Mars, the red planet, which we wanna draw small, small but bigger than series. I want you to go from series past, past this first fold to halfway between the first and second folds right halfway in there, and that's where Mars goes. Little bigger than Ceres, so there it is. So Ceres, first fold, second fold, Mars goes right in between there. Earth, my blue planet, our home, is going to go halfway between the second and the third folds, so right in there. It's the biggest of the four rocky planets. So there's my Earth halfway between the second and third. Venus, very yellowy. I'm gonna grab yellow even though it's hard to see. It's about the same size as Earth. It's gonna go right on this third fold right there. So I'm gonna make a, a nice yellow circle about the size of the Earth on that. And then lastly, Mercury. I'm going to grab my gray again. And I'm going to make slightly smaller than Mars, but bigger than Ceres, just kind of approximate it. And Mercury is going to go halfway between Venus and the sun, right in the middle of that last section. So there is my Mercury. All right, so this is how the distances in the solar system actually look. So we can see, yeah, the inner planets are closer together than the outer ones, but far more dramatically than just about any quick shot image that if you Google image solar system that you're going to see. So now I'll take a few questions and then what I want to do is hand it over to Cece, who is going to talk more about what this means to try and talk to spacecraft, what it means we try and talk to those spacecraft. All right, Cece, take it away. Thank you so much, Zoe, for the intro. Hi, everyone. My name is Cece. I'm a senior at Cornell studying astronomy and planetary science. And today I'm so excited to be here and help you navigate through the solar system. So as Zoe walked you through, you should now have your beautiful map of the solar system. Doesn't fit in a single frame here, but that's because now we understand how far apart each of these planets are. We can kind of get a better sense of scale for how spread out the solar system actually is. And so since we have that intuition now, I want to kind of build upon that and walk you through how close these planets are in terms of now communication time with spacecraft. So we communicate with spacecraft using, using radio, which is a kind of light, and light travels at 670 million miles per hour, which is incredibly fast. To give you a sense of how fast that is, the International Space Station, which orbits Earth, travels at 17,500 miles per hour, still incredibly fast, and the Parker Solar Probe, which is the fastest man-made object, that travels at 435,000 miles per hour. Again, 
super fast, but 670 million miles per hour for light is still way faster. And so let's talk about now how quickly light takes to travel to between different planets and different bodies of the solar system. To start and give you an example, I'm going to talk about the moon. And so as you'll see on our diagram, we have our four inner planets, but we don't actually have the moon drawn on our map. And that's because it's so, it's because of the scale at which we drew our solar system and that it would be too close to earth for us to draw. And so you'll remember that Zoe mentioned the sun here at the beginning, at the start of our solar system, just had to draw it really thin and that realistically it would be the width of one of your hairs. So now the earth to moon distance would be one quarter of the width of your hair. And that's just way, way too small for us to draw and you know, really actually see on paper, which is why we don't have the moon drawn onto our map. Another way to think about it is if you think of a standard size globe of the earth, it's about like one foot in diameter, the moon would be 30 feet away from that globe. And in terms of communication time, which is what we'll be focusing on, the travel time for light between the earth and the moon is 1.25 seconds. So we know that that is pretty quick in terms of communication. You know, having a one second delay isn't a big deal. So if we know it takes 1.25 seconds for light to travel from the earth to the moon, how long do we think it takes from, for light to travel from the earth to the sun, All right? In the interest of time, I won't wait too long and I'll just tell you it takes eight minutes. So here on our map, we have the earth and then the sun and that dis average distance between the earth and sun is called one astronomical unit. And that's 150 million kilometers in distance. And that takes eight minutes. So we have our scaled map of the solar system and we can see from the earth to the sun is one AU astronomical unit and in time that is eight minutes. And so now that we have that kind of ratio, we're going to use proportions to, of, the, of the solar system from this map to now calculate on your worksheets how far it takes to communicate with spacecraft at different parts in our solar system. So for an example here, I'm going to show you for the light travel communication time for Ceres. Let me just get this folded. So Ceres is right here in the asteroid belt. And we can see that on average, it is going to be actually 2.8 AU from the sun as an example. And so we know that one AU is eight minutes. So if I multiply eight minutes per one astronomical unit times 2.8 astronomical units, we can find that Ceres to the sun would take 22.4 minutes for the light to travel. And so now if you could start getting out your worksheets, I'm going to give you two minutes to try and run through the calculations yourself for as many of the planets as you can and calculate that light speed to Earth. All right, so it's okay if you had not finished all of the calculations yet, that is totally fine, we're a bit short on time, but just to walk you through how long it actually takes for light to travel between different parts of the solar system, I'd like to start going through the slides to share with you. So first we have Mercury and so our first planet here is Mercury, and on average, it is about one AU from Earth. So it takes eight minutes from light for light to travel from Earth to Mercury. And next, we have Venus. So as you can see, Venus is here relative to our Earth. And since it's an average of 1.1 AU away, the light travel time to Earth is nine minutes. So still in the order of minutes, we're pretty close right now. And continuing to Mars, Mars is on average 1.7 AU from Earth, so it takes 11.7 minutes to, on average, to communicate with Mars. And next for Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is on average 5.3 AU from Earth, so it takes about 42 minutes to communicate one way with uh, for spacecraft. And for Saturn, a bit farther, 9.6 AU takes one hour and 17 minutes for light to travel from Earth to Saturn. So we're starting to get a bit farther. We've, um, we've passed the point of minutes and have crossed over into hours now. And continuing to Pluto in the Kuiper belt, that's on average 33.8 AU away, which means it takes four hours and 30 minutes for us to communicate with a spacecraft. 
out in, in the inner edge of the Kuiper belt at Pluto. And last for the Voyager missions, which are the two, I believe, farthest objects from Earth, farthest man-made objects from Earth, excuse me. The average light travel times to Earth for Voyager 1 is 20 hours and 16 minutes, and for Voyager 2, 16 hours and 48 minutes. And you'll note that, you notice how on these slides we say average travel time, which is what also we had to calculate. We say average because the planets all orbit the sun at kind of different speeds, different rates. So Earth might be over here, whereas and Mars is still on this side of the sun. So the average time is because the planets orbit at different speeds. And so sometimes Earth and Mars might be on opposite sides of the sun, which make it take much, much longer to communicate with Mars than what we calculated for the purposes of spacecraft communication, and especially with the recent landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars, those missions are timed so that Earth and Mars are as close as they can be to speed up communication. And so that's why during within like a year orbit for a given planet, it will be different a different distance from the other planets throughout its orbit. So that's why we calculate the average light travel time. All right, and so that concludes our activity. The thing we want you to take away thinking about this is the fact that we cannot talk to these spacecraft in real time, control them by like a video game or, you know, a remote control car or something like that. Talking to spacecraft and someday to people going out is going to be much more like emails and texting, not phone calls and Zoom meetings. And so be thinking about those challenges and how you would run a spacecraft that you could only talk to a few minutes each day and it took minutes or even hours for it to receive the signal, and if it wanted to talk back to you minutes or hours for you to get the message back. How do asteroids form? We think they form similar to the Earth, the primordial asteroids, where it's just gravity bringing things together at the beginning of the solar system. But that's not the only way you get an asteroid because planets and asteroids also early on were being destroyed by collisions because everything used to be a lot crowded, a lot more crowded. And so some asteroids are literally formed secondarily as rubble heaps of gathering together rubble of previous bodies that were destroyed. And so there's different ways that you can form those asteroids, depending on if they formed at the beginning or they formed later from leftovers from collisions. The asteroid belt, I will say, is also incredibly empty, even though it's the most crowded place in the solar system. We do not really worry about hitting anything when we fly through it to get to the outer solar system. So it's not like in probably just about every movie that's tried to portray an asteroid belt, no. Okay, well, I will say as we sign off that I'm the manager of SPIF, the Spacecraft Planetary Image Facility, as you see there. We are a public facility, and that means that you can contact me, and eventually when we reopen to the public, you can come and visit SPIF to tour it. So if more questions pop into your head, feel free to reach out to us. That is what we are here for, and we can certainly connect you with NASA resources that can help to answer your questions.